So today we're going to talk about provisional patent applications with the, with the United States Patent Office. Um, so provisional patent applications are a relatively new type of application. Um, I think they're around 20 years old or so. Uh, the, they weren't, it wasn't always possible to do a provisional patent application. Um, but what, what happened was people were lobbying Congress saying, hey, um, we, it takes a long time for attorneys to be able to properly prepare a non-provisional application or a standard utility patent application is what it was called back then, just a utility patent. And uh, because it takes a long time or because there's so many requirements and so many formality requirements um, and so many things that you just can't change once it's filed, then you know it's taking months for us to get these filings in and we need them filed quickly because the priority date's really important. Anyway, so they were, they were saying, this is hard, and this is a problem, and this is making it difficult to do business, so what can we do? So what they decided to do was to allow sort of a temporary application with fewer requirements, fewer standards. Um, it wouldn't be examined, and since it wouldn't be examined, then all the examination requirements that you would have to have just don't have to be there, so it can be a lot less formal. They decided to call it a provisional patent application. Um, however, the standard utility patent application didn't have a name. It was just the patent application. And so since they called it the provisional application, the standard application then became called the non-provisional patent application to distinguish it from the provisional patent application. Um, and that, that has caused a lot of confusion with people because who calls the normal thing with a word starting with the word not, right? You just don't do that, but we do that. So the standard utility patent application that you need to file to get a patent registration in the end is the non-provisional patent application. Um, the provisional application, provisional means temporary or just for now, um, it's sort of a patch sort of a thing. And it's a great way to get your foot in the door in the patent office quickly, um, easy, less expensive. Um, that said, it does, a provisional patent application will not register. You have to follow it with a non-provisional patent application that, quote, claims priority to the provisional application. And basically what that means is that the non-provisional application in the filing documents will mention the provisional by its number and by its filing date and by the inventor um, and that ties the two together, and that says this non-provisional is based on the provisional, and for everything that's described in the non-provisional that's also described in the provisional, we want the priority date, the filing date of the provisional, and then everything that's new in the non-provisional gets the filing date of the non-provisional, and that's great. Um, now, it also adds an extra step an, an optional step, but it adds an extra step in the process. It adds some extra expenses, some extra government fees. It also delays when your application gets assigned to an art unit and therefore assigned to an examiner. So, so if you go the route of a provisional patent application first, know that in the long run, your total expenses and therefore your total return on investment will be different. Um, your expenses will be higher and your return will be lower. Um, also, it'll take you longer to get to the registration because a provisional lasts for about a year. And as long as you file the non-provisional before that year is up, then you can claim priority. But they don't assign an art unit to your application and, and therefore can't assign an examiner and therefore can't put it in the pile of things for that examiner to work on until you file the non-provisional. And so it will delay how long it takes to get patent in the end. So if those are things that would be a problem for you, then then maybe not going the provisional route is the best is the best option. Um, I found that there are about four situations where a provisional application is attractive and valuable to to an applicant. Um, one of them is is if you're short on time. If you have a a, a big show that you're going to and you're going to that show in less than a month um, there's not really time to file a standard patent application then um, going to the show and, and, and for business reasons it's super important
important that you show off your invention at the show, at the trade show or whatever. Um, so if you're running up against a deadline that's really short, a provisional application can get your protection in place um, and still allow you to go out and, and tell the world about your invention. Um, so if you're short on time, that's, that's helpful. If you're short on money, um, and, and remember, in the long run, it'll cost more to do a provisional, but if you're short on money today and won't be short on money later, then filing a provisional now can get you protection that you might not be able to afford right now. So that can be really helpful. Um, another one is if you're short on commitment to the project. So for example, if you, um, you want to do some market testing or you want to do something before you really commit to launching this product or this service, then filing a provisional allows you to, for less expense, get protection and be free to go out and, and do your testing or, or, or you know, launch the product um, or, or do a soft launch or a, a limited launch um, without giving up your rights to protect the invention. And then if that turns out well, you can then go forward with a non-provisional with more confidence that yes, this is what I want to do, I want protection in this area. If, if it turns out that it doesn't go well and you're going to just bag it, then you have your, your sunk cost, your investment that you're already put into it is less. And so that can be useful. And, and it's especially useful if, if you're a really prolific inventor, you invent a lot of things and you have some process for filtering which ones you're really going to go forward with, then you can file the quick, cheap provisional applications. Um, you know, a lot of uh, universities do this with their tech transfer office. They, they, they have lots of professors inventing lots of things and they're not quite sure which ones they really want to go forward with. So let's file provisional applications on everything. That gives us a year to sort out which ones we really care about. So that's another one. Um, uh, and then a fourth one, and this is especially true in the software space, there are some times where you've invented something, but there's still a lot of engineering to do. And creative people are going to be involved in the engineering. Um, you know, maybe the inventor's going to be there. And, and you think that maybe there's more ideas that haven't come out that are related to what you feel is new and unique and special about the invention. And that those are probably going to come out during that development. So what you might do is you might file a provisional application now, work on that, and then file the non-provisional application before the year is up. But everything that you've worked on and developed and solidified and clarified in your head, all that learning, all that knowledge, all the, the extra pieces that, that now exist that didn't exist when we filed the provisional, those are things we can include in the non-provisional. And so it's sort of in summary, a provisional can be really useful if you're short on money, if you're short on time, if you're short on commitment to the project, or if there's a lot of development yet to be done on it, but you need the protection now um, in order to really go forward with the development well. Um, and, and, and that can be really helpful because, you know, there's only, not everyone is willing to sign a confidentiality agreement or a non-compete agreement. And until you filed a patent application, you have no protection. And, and without those kinds of agreements. And even then, those agreements, sometimes they, sometimes, you know, non-competes, there's ways to get around them. Confidentiality agreements, people can sneak information out and if you can't ever prove that they disclosed it, then how do, how do you do that? So having a patent application filed protects you against everyone without any of them having to sign any agreements at all. And so that, that's, that's extremely helpful in moving things forward with your business. So uh, provisional patent applications uh, are great in those situations. If you're not in one of those situations, then maybe you would be better off going straight to a provisional, to a standard non-provisional patent application. Um, so as far as what's the difference between uh, the provisional application and the non-provisional application, uh, examples would be the drawing requirements. Uh, for a provisional patent application, I could sketch something on a napkin, um, take a photograph of it with my phone, or scan it into a computer, and I could file that. And it would look messy, and it would you know, be really informal, and it, and it wouldn't really comply with the drawing requirements that, they, that we have for patents, but it would be okay. Um, now, obviously, you want it to be clear enough that it makes sense and that you can tell what the things are, 
but as far as line width and margins and thicknesses and how big the, the, the letters are, you're not gonna have to worry about that. Uh, so that's one of the differences. Um, another huge difference is that you're not required to have claims in your provisional patent application. Now for foreign applications, sometimes it's important to have at least one claim in your provisional, especially if you're planning on filing in Europe. Um, in Europe, your claims can never be broader than your broadest claim in the priority document. And so if you do one really broad claim, then at least you've sort of set this boundary that's very far away and gives you more space in your, your claim, you know, your claim, what you can do with the claims in Europe. Um, if you're not planning on filing foreign applications, then there's no need for a claim in your provisional application. Um, sometimes what we'll do in claims and provisional applications is sort of do some, some sort of skeleton claims that give us sort of a reminder of what we were thinking we wanted to claim, um, or at least the directions we were wanting to go at the time that we filed it. Now, we may change our minds later, but at least that's a recordation of this is sort of what we were thinking about when we filed the application. And that way we get, you know, a year later, we get to get started where we left off instead of having to recreate that in our minds. So no claims, that's another big, um, a big change. The, um, one of the places where people sometimes get stuck with provisional applications is there is still a technical review, like a clerical review, to make sure that what you filed is what you said you filed. And so where people can get, get problems is if they have a list of drawings, say, you know, we have figures one through 10 in this application, um, and then they change their minds and take out some figures or they add some figures. So then the list of figures doesn't match the actual figures. Um, then they can kick it back and you can lose your priority date if you don't respond in time and respond properly. Um, so, so that's something you want to be careful with. Now that can be really helpful because what if you forgot to include a figure that you did want to include? Um, so that's why you still want to have your list of figures so that if they do catch that, then at least you catch that problem as quickly as you can. Um, but when you're filing the application, you want to be careful that you are filing everything that you plan to file and not leaving anything out, not making mistakes with that. The, um, uh, it's another difference with the provisional applications. The, uh, let's, let's focus on what, what needs to be there. So in the provisional patent application, you still need to meet the written description requirement, which means that you're describing it well enough that someone of ordinary skill in the art could recognize that yes, you've invented something, this isn't just science fiction, this is real, you, know, you have a real conception of what this invention is. The enablement requirement, which means that one of ordinary skill in the art could take it and go produce it. So for example, uh, an example I give a lot of times to people is I say, you know, imagine that what we filed with the government, that then gets sent to your programmers or your engineers or your, your chemists or whoever is going to put, you know, produce the invention. You go into a coma. You're gone for six months or you're gone for a year. They can't ask you questions. You can't comment. You can't critique. You can't review. You wake up in six months. They have to have produced, based on what you wrote, they have to have been able to produce a functioning invention. It doesn't have to function all the time. It doesn't have to be aesthetically the way that you want it to be, right? But it has to be functioning. And so if you can't describe it well enough that they can do that, um, now, if they're engineers, they're going to pick the screws. They may pick the materials if the materials are just optimization, right? Um, you don't have to include every little part and piece. So these are not, um, you don't have to give them every little detail, but you have to give them enough detail so that they can know where to go, what direction to go, what parts, what parts are there, how do they connect to each other, how do they work together, what's the final uh, functioning version like. You need to include enough description there. Now, another piece that you need to make sure is in the provisional is, um, is, is enough variations and enough description of, of different ways to do your invention that the doctrine of equivalence can be used um, if needed. And, and this is one of the ways that you prevent someone from just changing one little thing to get around your patent. 
Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about that, where people complain about patents and say, well, you just have to change one little thing and you get around the patent. Well, there's a whole doctrine called the Doctrine of Equivalence that fights against that, that if they just change one little thing, but they're essentially still doing the same thing, just not exactly what you say, they can still be infringing under the Doctrine of Equivalence. But it's really hard for that to apply if you describe one and only one version of your invention. You don't talk about, well, this part could be like this, or it could be like that, or it could be connected in this way, right? Um, and that's why you see a lot of language in patent applications, like, you know, it could be coupled there to, with a coupling device, including but not limited to snaps and buckles and clips and pins and rivets, and right? you see this big long list. Um, it's one of the reasons why patents, patent uh, applications and registrations are really boring to read is because we're trying to describe lots of different ways to do it. So you want to be specific enough that someone could make it and build it and use it, but you also want to be broad enough and varied enough that someone can't just change one little thing and get around the patent. Um, also be really careful about um, sometimes inventors want to hold back secrets. They want to hold back the, the, the secret sauce that really makes it work. If you describe your invention well enough that they can build it and they can build a, the, the best version of it, right? Um, that's really the standard you're looking for. If you're holding back a secret sauce to that invention, um, that could be used against you later on. Um, one, it could be used against you later on under best mode requirements. But, but worse would be if without the secret sauce, it doesn't even work at all. Um, and I've had, I've had people you know, tell me, oh, I want to get a patent on my, my chemical composition, right? But then they don't want to give me the recipe because they want to keep that secret. We can't get a patent on something, a chemical composition, when you keep the recipe secret. That's, it's a requirement that we be able to explain to the government how you make and use this. So, so Think carefully about um, if you're wanting to keep something back from the government, um, that could really cause huge damn problems to your patent application, even in the provisional stage. Um, anyway, so I think that's a good overview of uh, provisional patent applications, what they're good for, what they're like, some of the history of it. Um, I found them to be very useful, to be very helpful. Uh, and so, so I definitely do recommend that people use them when it's appropriate for the circumstances of the business. Um, it's, not, it's not right for everyone, um, and there's definitely ways to do it wrong, but, um, but where done right and done in the right situation, they can be extremely helpful. Hey, Jason, this is Tom. Uh, thanks so much for, for giving that overview. I, actually, I, I really liked that. I thought that was very helpful. I don't know that our members, if unless they're already familiar with patents, have ever heard anything about the doctrine of equivalence before. Uh -huh. So I thought that was a great thing to share. And um, I also, I mean, I, I've I've done a lot of provisional patents myself, and I do see the value in them as well. Um, but I didn't know that about European applications and including one broad claim. Uh -huh. um, so I thought that was also really useful, and I'll I'll definitely remember that. Uh, for myself in the future. Yeah. Um, and that makes a lot of sense to me because, um, you know, you obviously you want to include everything because if you don't disclose something, you can't claim it later. Uh -huh. um, but have you ever had it? I've had it happen where um, I don't think, I think it was maybe one of my patents where I included several different ways to accomplish something. Kind of mm -hmm. like you were talking about to give yourself some room in the, uh, the context of the doctrine of equivalence. And the patent examiner at one point said, Hey, you need to choose which road you're going to go down for this. And it's almost right. like there's two different species of this invention and which one right. is the one. So there must be a judgment call or a fine line between including variations and really having two inventions in one application. Yeah, and some of it is also um, how much work the examiner is willing to do. Um, I've had situations where the examiner came back and said, this is two inventions, and uh, either me or my client was like, no, no, it's not. We really want to keep this all together. Um, and the research that I've done in order to combat that, right, 
um, it kind of comes out that the examiner is the one who gets to decide that. Mm. Yeah. And there are ways to fight it, but but the examiner, of course, you're arguing back to the same examiner, and if the examiner is feeling um, like they don't want to do that much work, right? right? They don't want to do much that that much searching, or um, sometimes I think examiners sometimes will game the system in order to get easy. You know, if I if I can split the same application into two pieces, and it's essentially the same work I get to do twice, I get credit for having done work for two applications, but I only had to do one application mm. worth of work, right? So some sometimes I think they're legitimately saying, yes, this is two. Sometimes they think they're just gaming the system. Um, mm -hmm. And, but, but that said, when they issue those restriction elections is what they're called, the restriction requirements, right? And so right. you make a restriction election. Um, they have to say that they believe that they are patentably distinct variations. Mm. And that's a great thing for you because that means that if they can reject you on, on, on reject one of them, then they can't necessarily reject the other one. And so it sometimes gives you, it makes a distinction sometimes where there isn't really one, but it puts on the record, hey, this is patentably distinct from that. So just because this one gets rejected doesn't mean this one's automatically rejected too. Hmm. So that can go to your advantage as well sometimes. Um, so so my my practice on that is if an examiner does that, then, hey, you know what? That puts one nice thing on the record. Um, let's not fight it. Let's go ahead and, and let it happen. And then, and then the focus that we then do is say, all right, so these two things or these four things or whatever, however it's been split up, which of these do we really care about getting the patent first on? Uh, because whichever one we pick is going to go move forward with examination. We can file divisional applications for the others, but which one is commercially the most important that we get a patent on now? And that's the one that we pick. That makes sense. So that's, that's very insightful. It really does become a negotiation with the examiner at times, doesn't it? It does, very much so. Yeah. 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 And then the last thing I wanted to um, ask you, because I've – I've experienced this to an extent, and I'm curious if you agree, is that provisional applications, um, because they're, you want to make them very broad, you want to throw everything in there that you've thought of so that you don't miss anything that you want to claim later you didn't disclose. I, I find that when I'm in a licensing situation or a potential asset acquisition situation, somebody maybe wants to buy the patent uh, from me, that if I've left it in the provisional stage, if I do it in that first year before filing the full application, I think attorneys for who you're selling it to, that their patent attorney, tend to prefer that than if they're stuck with the language somebody else chose and filed a full application on, that they, they have a chance to sort of make their mark on it and try to be the hero for their client. I mean, do you, have you experienced that? So some of that will go on. Um, there's especially for large companies who have established protocols for how they do claims, how they write their descriptions. Um, a lot of times they'll prefer to be able to jump into that. Um, I've also seen kind of some of the other way around where if you have a provisional, but you don't have a non-provisional, then, um, they will criticize the provisional as, as not, um, not having what they would want it to have in there, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if like you filed your own provisional and you, you didn't do it with normal standards, right? Or sure. it doesn't look nice. I've seen you know that happen. Um, another one I've seen is where they will they'll negotiate with you, but they will intentionally draw the negotiations out because they think ah oh, maybe he doesn't have enough money to file the full patent. Huh. And if I can if I can get him to delay long enough and he doesn't meet his own deadline then now he's told me everything, he can't get a patent on it, um, and I can just walk off with it. So you wanna be really careful about negotiating during that stage and making sure to have a really strong showing that we're going to meet this deadline whether you sign a deal with me or not. Um, so you know, don't, don't come across as, hey, you're my one hope and I can't file a patent without you know, your licensing fees. So, so yes, yeah, so be careful with that. Yeah, that's unfortunate that, that some people would take advantage of you that way. But I think that that's the world we live in, unfortunately. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, wow. So insightful. Thank you so much, Jason. I really appreciate you being here today. And I know our members do too. So thank you so much. And uh, 
we'll look forward to uh, engaging with you on another related topic in the future. That sounds great. Okay. Thank you.